Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me tonight. I'm Dr. Heidi Schmelzer. I'm one of the audiologists at Lakeland Ear, Nose, and Throat. So I'm looking forward to talking to you tonight about hearing loss, um, some common signs and symptoms, um, the hearing test process, and then different options to treat that hearing loss. Um, I will be answering some questions at the end. So if you think of questions along the way, go ahead and go ahead and enter those into the little Q&A section. I'll be addressing them at the end. I'll do my best to get to as many as I can, but let's go ahead and get started. So just a little bit of information about hearing loss. About 48 million Americans are affected by a hearing loss. So hearing loss is not an uncommon issue. Over the age of 65, we expect to see about one in every three people with some degree of a hearing loss. As you might expect, after the age of about 75, that number does increase to about every two out of every three people. Hearing loss is often associated with aging in general, so we do expect to see it a little bit more with age. However, we do you see it in the younger years as well. Around 14% of people between ages 45 to 64 also have some degree of hearing loss. And it's not just adults that are affected. About 3 million American children do have a hearing loss, with approximately 1.3 million of those being under the age of three. So even infants can be born with the hearing loss or get an acquired hearing loss. At Lakeland, um, at Lakeland Ear, Nose, and Throat, we are being extra precautious this time of year, especially with cold flu season and coronavirus. With all those things going on, we are taking extra precautions to make sure all of our surfaces that are commonly touched, pens, anything like that are cleaned frequently. We are screening any employees, so every day we do a check to make sure we are safe to come to work and patients as they come in are also being screened just to maintain a very safe environment for everyone coming in. So now to talk about some of the common things that are associated with hearing loss. Some of you might be experiencing some of these. Some of you might know a family member or a loved one or a friend who's experiencing some of these things. But I think most people know someone with some type of degree of hearing loss and are familiar with these. But just as a quick overview to review, one of the common signs that someone has a hearing loss is that they feel that they like their TV or radio a little bit louder than the rest of their family or friends would prefer. That's pretty common. When the ear's not hearing as well, naturally we want a little bit more volume. Another thing to watch for as a common side effect of hearing loss or sign of hearing loss is tinnitus or ringing in the ears. When the ears aren't quite hearing the same and there's been a change in hearing, sometimes that ringing can occur as a byproduct of the hearing loss. Now, just as a little caveat to that, there are other things that can cause that ringing in the ears. That's why getting a hearing evaluation is important so we can make sure that we're ruling out hearing loss as a contributing factor. A lot of times with hearing loss, people will find themselves asking everyone to repeat a little bit more often, the huh and what. When the ears aren't hearing clearly, certain words can easily become indistinguishable from one another. For example, words like knock, like knocking on a door and not, might sound very similar for someone with a hearing loss. In certain contexts, you might think you heard one thing, but actually it was another. Struggling in background noise and the inability to really understand speech when there is background noise present is another big complaint of people when they have a hearing loss. The ears are working so hard to hear what the main focus is, but sometimes that background noise can just overpower those little clues and cues in speech, making it really difficult to follow what's being said. And along that same vein, struggling to concentrate on speech is also another sign that you might have something going on with your hearing. When you're working really hard to hear because your ears aren't picking up those sounds can be pretty tiring and confusing. 
Another complaint I commonly hear is that people will come in and say, I just feel like everyone's mumbling. Things just don't sound as crisp or as clear. Depending on the type of hearing loss, it can really impact how the ears perceive the, the cues in speech, those very soft consonants. So any of these signs are a good indication that you probably should get a hearing test. One of the things you can do is if you have any concerns about any of these symptoms, go ahead and talk to your primary care doctor and ask them for a referral. They'll make the referral over to us and that's when we can start the evaluation process with a hearing test. Sometimes we do refer on to our ear, nose, and throat physicians if we see something else that we want to get checked out. So as a quick overview here, there's three main parts to the ear. The external ear, that's the part that you can visibly see. Sound travels into the ear canal and bounces off the eardrum, or as you may hear us refer to it as the tympanic membrane. That's the start of the middle ear system. As we go past that eardrum, that's the location for the three smallest bones in the body, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. You may have heard them referred to as the anvil, the hammer, and the stirrup. Those are kind of the common names. When sound bounces off that eardrum, it sends those three little bones into motion, creating a different wave that sends sound from that middle ear system into the inner ear. Now the inner ear is where a lot of the hearing magic happens. As sound is transmitted into the inner part of the ear called the cochlea, little tiny cells called hair cells, but not to be confused with actual hair, receive that signal and transmit it to the auditory nerve, which then in turn transmits it up into the brain for processing. Here Hearing loss can occur in any portion along the pathways, so it could occur in the ear canal, to the eardrum, to those little bones, cochlea, the nerve, or beyond. Now, when you come in for a hearing test, after we do the hearing test, we review the results and talk to you about what we're seeing. Now, there's three common types of hearing loss. The first one is a conductive hearing loss. This can occur when sound just doesn't travel efficiently through that outer and middle ear system. Some common causes are fluid in the ears, ear infections. Anytime someone has a hole or we call it a perforation or a ruptured eardrum, that can really affect that transmission of sound. A really big factor that plays a role is earwax. If wax ends up in the ear and it's blocking so that sound cannot get to the eardrum, that can cause that conductive hearing loss. Some people will feel like their ears really plugged up. Swimmer's ear can affect a lot of people. Foreign bodies in the ear. Sometimes we see that with younger people. They like to put things in their ears that shouldn't be there. So we always want to address that. Occasionally, we do see benign tumors in the ear that do block this pathway of sound. And we also sometimes see malformations of the outer and middle ear. So something congenital that someone was born with. So that's a conductive hearing loss. Now a sensory neural hearing loss is pretty common as well. Age-related hearing loss does play a big role in the sensory neural aspects. Now a sensory neural hearing loss occurs when there's damage to the inner portion of the ear the cochlea or beyond. So as I mentioned, the number one cause for a sensory neural hearing loss is typically aging. As we age, our bodies change and the nerves and the cochlea do change as well. Hereditary hearing loss. So we often see that hearing loss can occur in families. Sometimes a virus or an illness can cause a change in hearing. Someone who has been on a chemotherapy, depending on what type of medications or treatments were used, so any type of ototoxic medications, that can cause a sensory neural hearing loss as well. Head trauma, if there's any damage that happened to fracture the skull and damage the cochlea or the inner ear at that time, that can cause that. Malformations to the ear, typically congenital, can also cause a sensory neural hearing loss. 
And then another one we see a lot of is noise exposure. When loud noises enter the auditory system, over time and over a lot of exposure and loud exposure, that can really play a number on that auditory system, causing that hearing loss. Typically, we see that as a hearing loss more in those high frequencies where people struggle with that clarity. They just can't make out what's being said. It just doesn't sound as clear anymore. Now, the last one you may hear an audiologist talk about is a mixed hearing loss. As you could probably guess, a mixed hearing loss is when there's a conductive hearing loss and a sensory neural hearing loss at the exact same time. A good example would be someone who's worked here and years in construction, been around lots of machinery, loud noises, loud trucks, and then they happen to get an ear infection on top of everything. They already have a hearing loss that's sensory neural in nature, but then that ear infection creates a conductive component as well because that fluid is messing up the transmission through the inner, through the middle ear system, excuse me, to the inner ear. Now, typically, after the hearing test, we'll talk to you about the type of hearing loss, but then the audiologist will also go over the degree of hearing loss. Now, there's no real good scientific way to calculate hearing loss as a percentage because there is a pretty big range for normal hearing. So that 0% to anywhere around 20% is a little bit of a gray area. What you'll actually hear an audiologist describe hearing loss as, we use the term degree of hearing loss. This can range anywhere from mild to profound. Now, as we progress from that mild to profound, that just means there's a little bit more and a little bit more hearing loss. So for example, if someone comes in and we find a mild hearing loss, that person might notice that they struggle to hear whispers, but they still can hear average conversational speech. In one-on-one -on -one conversation, they're really not having that hard of a time. Now, someone with a severe or profound hearing loss might come in and they're not even gonna be able to hear that speech. They're gonna struggle to hear loud sounds such as a truck engine or an airplane flying overhead. Some of those really loud sounds will be difficult for them as well. Now, when you come in to see one of us audiologists, we assess the entire pathway of hearing. So we start off with otoscopy, looking in the ears to make sure that there's no wax that's in the way. If there is, then we make sure we get an appointment scheduled to get that wax out of the way so we can test the pathways without any obstructions. If there's a malformation, that'll be something we'll address as well. Once we know that the ear canal is free of any debris and we're able to see that eardrum, then we do another test called tympanometry. You may also hear us refer to that as a pressure test. With that, we're able to hold a little piece up to the ear that plays a low frequency sound. That sound actually lets us see how the eardrum moves in response. If there's fluid behind the eardrum, we get a certain type of response. If there's a hole in the eardrum, we get another. And if everything's great, we see the typical pattern of eardrum movement. Then the part everyone is pretty familiar with, or at least has a guess about, the hearing test. We use earphones in the ears to test how the ears and how softly the ears pick up different sounds at different frequencies. The audiogram is our way of plotting that. The human ear can hear anywhere between about 20 to, to 20,000 hertz. So it's a pretty big range of hearing. But in audiology, we typically assess anywhere between about 250 to 8,000 hertz, because that's where speech is most prevalent. All of our sounds for speech fall within that range. Now, where the hearing loss occurs, whether it's low frequency or high frequency or in the middle frequencies, that makes a big difference in how the person perceives the hearing loss. A low frequency hearing loss may cause someone to feel like they just don't have enough volume. They're struggling to hear sounds. They just want the volume louder. Now with a high frequency hearing loss only, someone might come in and say, everyone just sounds like they're mumbling. I just can't quite tell if they said this or that. Now hearing loss can have some side 
side effects. Social avoidance and withdrawal can often occur. If you feel like you're struggling and you know that you're going to be exhausted after a night out with people, a lot of times hearing loss can cause those people to say, you know, I'm not going to go out because I know I won't be able to participate. I'll just be sitting in the corner by myself. We do know that there is a link between untreated hearing loss and cognitive or memory issues. So it's really, really important to get hearing addressed as soon as we can to figure out how much hearing loss and get it treated. Depression is linked to hearing loss. People who have hearing loss are often associated with um, safety issues and increased fall risk. And then overall, a lot of people with hearing loss notice that they just feel that their quality of life is decreasing as the hearing loss progresses. That's why we need to treat it. So after a hearing loss is diagnosed, each person, each hearing loss, each ear is very, very different. Everyone's unique. For some people, medical or surgical treatment may be recommended. A visit to the ear, nose, and throat physician may be warranted just to make sure everything is as it should be or for treatment. Now for others, depending on what their hearing needs are, amplification devices such as hearing aids, implantable devices such as a cochlear implant or any osseointegrated devices may be recommended. Now this is where the audiologist comes in. So as an audiologist, I'm here to walk beside you during this process. You're not alone in finding out what's going to help your ear. We review the different treatment options. We review the different types of devices available and what's going to be the best. For each person, it's a little bit different. So even people, family members who all have similar hearing losses, they may benefit from a different type of device. Now, just a quick overview of some of the different devices. The most common one people are familiar with are hearing aids. Hearing aids are devices that actually aid the ear, so they don't correct hearing loss completely. They, they can't make hearing perfect again. They are an aid. But what they do is they actually take and amplify sounds at a specific frequency as needed to bring those sounds into a more audible range for the ear, so the ear doesn't have to struggle. There's lots of different sizes, styles, technology options, and manufacturers. Through Lakeland, we work with a few different brands, Bonac, Unitron, Resound, and Widex, just to name the, the main ones that we work with. Each has their own little merits, so that's where, depending on your listening needs, that's where we make that decision of which device is going to help you the most in those areas of concern. For some people, it's music. For some people, it's speech. Now, I'm a cochlear implant audiologist by nature, so cochlear implants are definitely my passion. For people who have a hearing loss where hearing aids are no longer benefiting them, they've just reached the maximum of their capabilities for that hearing loss, a cochlear implant can be a fabulous option. This is a surgical process. Our ENT physician, Dr. Paul Judge, is one who actually does the surgeries and an outpatient surgery. So in and out in the same day. When he does the surgery, he actually implants a little piece into the inner portion of the ear, the cochlea. There's a healing process after that. So during that time of waiting, the ear doesn't hear any sounds. To actually activate the cochlear implant does require an external piece. So if you look in the picture, there's a sample of the internal piece on that table right next to the penny, but then the sound processor or one of the options for the sound processors is on the ear model. A sound processor sits behind the ear to pick up sounds. That little cable and coil are connected and make contact with the internal piece through magnetic connection. That's how the ear is able to receive sounds electrically rather than acoustically. So we're bypassing a damaged auditory system to give it a stimulation that it isn't able to use auditorily or acoustically. Now, as the audiologist who works with cochlear implants, I work through activations and programming. 
For a lot of people, it is a big commitment because it does take a lot of time to retrain the ear and brain how to hear with a cochlear implant. It's a vastly different way for the ears to perceive sound, but in the end, it is a very rewarding change because most people really notice big improvement with their hearing. Now, osseo integrated devices, you may hear us call them bone anchor hearing aids or BAHAs or bone conduction devices. These are devices that treat a different type of hearing loss they're actually integrated into the bone of the skull, which is why we use the term osseo integrated, literally bone integrated. They actually use vibrations to transmit sounds into the inner portion of the ear and they bypass the outer and middle ear system. This is a surgical process as well. There's a little implant implanted into the skull that actually makes that attachment to the external sound processor. It's an outpatient surgery done by our ENT physician, and then the audiologist activates and helps with programming and maintenance of the devices. Now, sadly, just on average, a lot of people wait about seven years before actually seeking treatment when they first suspect hearing loss or when they're first diagnosed with hearing loss. Now, we find that people who do seek early treatment they end up feeling that their quality of life is improved sooner. They get better outcomes with the treatment options because the hearing loss isn't as severe. Many people find they do better adjusting to hearing aids as the hearing loss progresses rather than waiting. Overall, there's less impact from those very, very sad side effects, depression, cognitive issues. So we do see improvement for those. Now, we're here for you at Lakeland. So if you're interested to get to know more about our team, you can visit uh, lakelandent.com. That has a little bit of information about myself. I have two other wonderful audiology colleagues. We have our three ear, nose, and throat physicians, and then two physician extenders. So, and we are happy to see you and answer your questions. We do have two locations, one in Niles and one in St. Joseph. You can schedule to see an audiologist or an ENT physician at either location. So I'm going to take a look through the questions and answers and, and go ahead and address some of those. Bear with me as I technology here. So I see a question about ringing in the ears. Actually, I see a couple questions about ringing in the ears. Good questions. So there's a lot of things that can cause ringing in the ears. So one of the first things that we do is we definitely recommend a hearing test. Hearing loss and ringing in the ears often go hand in hand, but there are other things that can cause that ringing in the ears. For some people, TMJ can cause an issue blood pressure issues with ringing in the ears. We also see that increased stress, increased caffeine intake, um, a lot of anxiety, some medications, um, a lot of use of aspirin. Those can also play a role in that ringing. So a hearing test is really, really important to determine if hearing loss is the cause and should be treated or if there's something else that needs to be addressed. Another question I see is, will hearing aids help with tinnitus as well as the hearing loss? That's a little bit of a complicated question. A lot of times we do see that people notice a lot of benefit from the hearing aids for that tinnitus when they do have a hearing loss that's associated with that tinnitus. The other nice thing with hearing aids is there's different features we can activate that help give the ears something else to look listen to. So possibly the amplification by itself may help if there is an underlying hearing loss. And sometimes the ear just needs a little extra help, which the hearing aids are, are able to help with as well. And that's something that we do go over when you come in and talk about hearing aids. We'll talk about the different styles and what options have that best feature that's going to really help your ears. So question about how can I get a hearing test? So best way is 
to your doctor. So talk to whoever your primary care provider is and let them know that you have a concern about your ears and your hearing. They'll get that referral process started. That's when you'll get scheduled to see myself or one of my colleagues. And if we see something that we need addressed by the ear, nose and throat physician, we can also make that referral as well. Now, one thing that I also want to mention is that there are some things that are really important, really, really important to get addressed sooner rather than later. For anyone who has uh, hearing loss or ringing that has occurred suddenly or is bothersome in just one ear, we really want to make sure that you are being seen as soon as possible. Or for someone whose hearing suddenly changed, we really want to see you as soon as we possibly can. There's a narrow window of time that the hearing loss can be treated with some good outcomes. A lot of times people end up waiting a little bit too long and then there's really not a lot we can do once we get past that critical window. Dizziness is another issue. So for people who have sudden onset of dizziness, sometimes there's a relation between something going on in that inner ear system with the cochlea and the vestibular system, we do want to get that addressed as well. So with tinnitus, I'm seeing a question about a uh, constant motor sound. Oftentimes people will notice that tinnitus or ringing in the ears, it's perceived either as a tone or sometimes people will feel that it's more of a buzzing or a humming sound. I would recommend that get a hearing test. Let's see how the hearing is and then we can always address what option is going to be the best to use amplification or use one of those tinnitus maskers to really help with that sound. But without the hearing test, it's a little bit different difficult to say, so I always encourage a hearing test first. I see a great question of how can I get a, an appointment to see if I need a hearing aid. First, first stop always is that hearing test. Until I have a better idea or the other audiologists have a better idea of what the hearing loss looks like. Is it high frequency? Is it low frequency? One ear, both ears? That's where we really can't comment on if someone needs a hearing aid until we know what the ears are doing. Once we know that, then that's a great way to then and say, let's talk about options. What's going to be the best fit for you, your listening needs, your lifestyle needs, and your ears needs? So some solutions for a hearing loss in just one ear. Again, and I probably sound like I'm repeating myself, let's always start with the hearing test. But actually, there are some great options for those people who do have a hearing loss in just one ear. Now, there's several different options, so I really can't cover all of that right now in the time that we have, but one of the options is sort of like a hearing aid system where sound is actually transmitted to the better ear from a microphone in one, to the hearing aid in the other. That way you still get this perception of sound from the other side. Another one is one of those Osseo integrated devices, which does the same thing, but it routes it through bone conduction rather than acoustically. But that's something that we make sure we have an appointment to sit down and go through those options so you know what you're getting yourself into because there's, there's a lot of information about them. So how do we determine the best hearing aids? When I look at a hearing test, what I'm looking at is overall, where does the hearing loss occur? Is it more in the low frequencies? Is it more in the high frequencies? Then what I, after, after I look at that, the next thing I'm addressing is, what does the person's lifestyle look like? For someone who is home and in quiet and in one-on-one -on -one conversations, then I can make a recommendation for a certain type of hearing aid. Now, if someone comes in and they have a busy lifestyle, we we'll use the example of someone who teaches fifth grade. They're around fifth graders all day long. They also make sure they're supervising in gym class where it's loud and echoey, and they like to run on weekends and hang out with their friends. There's going to be a different recommendation 
recommendation for that lifestyle versus someone who's only in quiet primarily. Now also too, if someone says, hey, streaming and being able to hear phone calls is really important to me. There's devices that really have a leg up and that extra, extra special boost with Bluetooth streaming. So then people can stream phone calls directly to their ears at the volume that their ears need. So a question about amplifiers and working for all sounds. Now, amplifiers are a little bit tricky when it comes to certain types of hearing loss. With someone who has just a hearing loss in either the high or low frequencies, when they use an amplifier, amplifiers are actually amplifying, as the name says, all sounds across the board. So it's like turning up a stereo and just turning that knob all the way up. Now, with a hearing aid, the hearing aid makes some different changes. More like if you're going to change the equalizer on a, on a ampler, excuse me, on a stereo system, and you're going to adjust the trebles or the bass or the mid frequency. So an amplifier gets a little bit tricky for those people where they have a hearing loss in just a certain range. Because if we end up amplifying one part to the volume that the ear needs, we do run the risk of actually over amplifying other sounds, potentially actually causing more damage to the hearing because of that loud sound. Just looking at a couple more of these questions. So costs for hearing aids and the hearing test. So those are established costs through Lakeland, your nose and throat, and insurance typically does cover um, the hearing test portion. We do ask that you get a referral from your primary care physician. We want to make sure that there is that referral in there. Now, hearing aids covering by being covered by, by insurance, that's a little bit more tricky. Some plans cover different aspects. Some plans don't cover anything. When someone comes in for a hearing test and then decides they do want to take that next step and schedule, we call it our hearing aid consultation. So that's an appointment to talk about the hearing loss and what's the next step, what amplification device, what hearing aid, what bone conduction device, what cochlear implant is going to be the best option for their ears. We check with the insurance prior to that appointment so we have an idea if there is coverage, how much coverage there is. So that one is a really tough question to answer because for every insurance plan it's a little bit different. And then I also see a question about my experience with cochlear implants. So ever since I started as an audiologist, cochlear implants have been my passion. I really love being able to take people on that journey from struggling to hear acoustically, struggling with their hearing aids, and walking with them as they take that first step into electric hearing, when they're able to really perceive sounds that they weren't able to hear through hearing aids anymore. Hearing aids have just reached their limits. And really getting to share that excitement of when those people finally realize, hey, I got to hear my family member, my loved one, my friend. I heard them say my name. I wasn't able to do that with my hearing aids. So that's really rewarding. And I'm really excited that I was brought on with Lakeland Ear, Nose and Throat to provide this service to the community because it's such a rewarding thing for me. So it looks like, it looks like that's about all of the questions. I don't know if anyone else has any other questions, but I would encourage you if any of those signs or symptoms of hearing loss, if any of those rang a bell and you feel like, man, yep, that, that was me, that, yep, she hit it, the nail on the head. That is exactly how I'm feeling, I'm struggling. I feel tired and fatigued after having conversations with people. I'm struggling in background noise. I have ringing in my ears. I have a hearing loss in just one ear. Talk to your primary care physician, get that referral, come over and take that first step and get that hearing test. Once we do that, 
then we can talk the next options of what's going to be best to get your ears hearing better again and get you back into the back into the hearing world. So thank you for joining me and I hope to meet some of you in person in the office at some point. Thanks for coming in everybody.